come to worship at resurrection. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there are, were many who were appalled at him, his appearance is so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. <clears throat>
God for our special consideration on this Good Friday. It's recorded for us in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, beginning at verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. The word of the Lord. Today is the very best day. Today is the very worst day. Today is the day of greatest joy and the day of deepest sorrow. Today is the day of bitter defeat and death. And today is the day of total victory. Today is Good Friday, the very best Friday, the day where we see our Savior Jesus suffer and die for the sins of the whole world. Today is the day that Jesus undoes that ancient curse that came to humanity all the way at the beginning, when by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the curse came upon our first ancestors and has loomed over us every day since. Today is the day Jesus takes that curse away. By hanging on a pole, the tree of a cross, undoing that ancient deadly curse. As we see God's word today, Christ lifts the curse by becoming our curse, so that we, on the basis of faith, would have life through him. Because today is the day our God died to give us life. Now, throughout history there are many examples of famous or infamous curses, however you want to label them. Probably could chalk most of them up to something else. Take, for example, our own presidential history. If you know your history well, from 1840, every 20 years, all the way through JFK. Our presidents died in office, starting with William Henry Harrison, Tippecanoe and Tyler II, and ending there with JFK. For nearly a hundred years, after the Boston Red Sox traded away Babe Ruth, they could not claim a World Series title, and maybe some of you here are fans. Chicago Cubs took longer than that. They took the full century. Are those really curses? Couldn't we chalk those things up to circumstance? Coincidence. Poor management. Bad preparation. In the case of William Henry Harrison, one very long speech landed him in the grave. Don't worry, the speech won't be that long. At the same time, there is a curse that is true and clear. A curse that is so ancient it has fallen upon all of humanity. A curse we know intimately far too well. It's a curse that God has placed on humankind. The worst part is, it's our own fault. This curse is called death. Death, the due penalty for the perversion of our pride. For our nonconformity, our willing disobedience to God's holy will. Death is what we deserve. For all the times we fail to listen to what God says. Or for all the times we listen to everything other than what God says. The curse that has come upon all of humankind and has reigned supreme every day since, since our first ancestors fell into this curse. And it rules our hearts too. 
or at least it did. There are many people who try to find some solution to that ancient, ages-old curse. And they'll find it, find, try to find it in religion, spirituality, by doing what they find best. They create their own recipes for resolving the curse of death. Sprinkle in a dash of more good than bad, or a, a base of being better than someone else. Try to balance it all out with the right ingredients of more good than bad. It, it has its own spirituality to it. It can, for a moment, assuage the conscience, ease your guilt, and make you feel better. But does it really satisfy the holy God who placed the curse on you? And does it really make us escape the curse of death? There God makes the answer abundantly clear in the text we read. The answer is no. No one who relies on works of the law will be saved. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. They bring the curse down upon themselves. We do too. By relying on our own works. We bring this curse on ourselves. That just like it's written, it's stood written for centuries. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Everyone, all of humanity, has fallen under this curse for not doing everything. Continuing, abiding, living in everything, not just when it's convenient, not just when we're at our best or at full strength, not just when we're well rested or no longer hungry, Continuing, abiding in everything. Not cherry picking the things that work for us, not what we're best at. Everything to the left. Written in the book of the law. Not some law written in our own conscience, but God's own holy law that declares what is right and good. Everyone who fails to do absolutely everything, everyone who does not do it all to the letter, relying on themselves, all of humanity, falls under this curse. And again, people turn to religion to try to help. They turn to the religion of works and try to resolve it in other ways, by giving God a greater or lesser role so that we can at least feel a little bit better. Maybe some have said, God will have mercy after you've done everything you can do. Others try to say, God will give you grace so that you can do what is in you. Do your own best. And that will save you from this curse. But does it stack up? Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything. No one who relies on this law will be justified or declared right before God. And instead of this somehow delicious cocktail, this mixture of milk and chocolate syrup that we think we're getting by adding God into the equation, we end up with bitter poison, arsenic, that takes our souls down to hell. There is no mixture that works. Works cannot be mixed in unless you're doing it all. By relying on yourself, you only bring the curse down upon yourself. But that was never God's plan to save us by works. While it does feel good to say exactly what he said, the promises he made, the one who does these things will live by them. If that's the only criteria, none of us will live. But God has laid out in his word, centuries before, how he plans to work this out and resolve it. He says, the righteous will live by faith. It stands written and has stood written for centuries, millennia. God's plan to lift the curse. Christ lifts the curse. But 
How can that be? And what do those words mean? The righteous will live by faith. There's a lot to unpack there. For that matter, how can God say that the one who does everything except one is going to be damned, but the one who does nothing, absolutely nothing, relying nothing on themselves, you see, it's everything, is saved. This seeming paradox, a seeming contradiction in God, that God threatens to punish everyone who does not do everything and at the same time promises eternal life. That same paradox that God must punish sin in sinful man. And yet he proclaims to be a God of love. How can this be? How can God hate sin and love sinners? We find this paradox resolved quite simply. Because it's not that hard for God to resolve the impossible. What's logically impossible to us, it's not that difficult for him. That doesn't mean it was easy. And it wasn't cheap. Christ lives the curse by becoming the curse. It seems strange. How, how can that even be? How can Jesus become a curse, the sinless Son of God, true-born Son of Man, even just the way it's phrased, how can a person be a curse? But what else did Jesus come to do on this good Friday? But to be the object of ridicule and scorn, as his enemies tormented him, they spat at him, mocked him, insulted him for everything he claimed to be, as they called out to him to save himself, and then they would believe him. As they treated him like they thought the king of the Jews ought to be treated. And as that ancient enemy, Satan, tried to get him to slip up at one last spot, he became the curse. As people mocked him, and jeered him, and taunted him, an object of a violent, a forgotten thought long left to die, hanging alone on a cross. The death that we deserve. The punishment that ought to come on us comes on him instead as he becomes the curse itself. As God in heaven leaves this Jesus alone to die, abandoning him to hell on a cross, our hell, the punishment that all sin deserves, as Christ lifts the curse, as he lifts himself off the ground onto a cross, for the sins that we commit, for the sins of the whole world, takes our sins upon himself, endures our on that cross, so that he can become the curse and redeem us from the curse of the law. He redeems us, liberates us, buys us back, where formerly we were subject to sin and death, subject to the law that condemned us. Christ sets us free because he lifted the curse by dying on a pole. Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. As by the tree of that cross, Jesus takes the curse upon himself, takes the wrath that we incur to give you what he has earned, eternal life, redeeming you from the curse, taking the curse away, so that none of it is left. No punishment. No punishment but what he got. He takes it for In your place. As he takes on the gravity of our guilt, the depths of our depravity, the seriousness of our sin, to give you what you haven't earned, 
redemption. Why? He lifts the curse from you so that finally you are free from the shackles of sin and death. Why? Maybe you know the answer already. But why would God put his own son through such misery and torment? How can we call such innocent suffering good on this good Friday? It's for our good that he suffered. It's because he loves you. It's because God wants you to know that from the very beginning, from the moment he announced the Savior would come in the Garden of Eden and before he created the world, this was his plan. It culminates on this day, this good Friday. And here he tips his hand, reveals his cards, and shows what the plan always was. To rescue you from the curse by dying for you. To redeem you from death by living for you. Here, at the cross of Christ, he saves you from the curse that we have brought on ourselves by bearing that curse for us. He lifts the curse. It has no bearing on you, and now death itself is nothing more than a bridge to life with God, who gave all things for you so you would know his love, the depths of his love, that from the very beginning he planned it this way, that he would suffer for you, so you would know how much he's willing to do, what he's willing to do to save you. How deep his love must run. So this cross, on which Christ bears our curse, it becomes for us the greatest symbol, the symbol of God's love, the symbol of his victory over death, because Christ, by that cross, conquered death and lifted the curse So it is today, a good Friday. The day our Savior redeemed us from sin and death, the best of all things. Because today we see God punish sin, but not on us. Today we see God loves us. Today we see his heart, how deeply that love must be. Today we have total victory because Jesus, who died on the cross on Good Friday, will not stay here, but he rises to eternal life. So yes, happy Good Friday. It is a happy and joyous day because Jesus gives us God's love. Jesus gives us eternal life. And Jesus, who gives those things to us, calls out to us from the cross. God will not abandon you, but will take you through death to life. The righteous will live by faith, that you who have been made right with God will live forever, simply by trusting what Jesus has done. Amen. We continue with the next two stanzas of the hymn found printed in your service.
Bible records for us seven times that Jesus spoke as he was dying on the cross for the sins of the world. You will hear those parts of the Bible in order. The first word. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him, Jesus, to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The word of the Lord. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. They divide my garments among them. And cast lots for my clothing. He bore the sin of many. And made intercession for the transgressors. Gracious Savior, you did not strike back with revenge against your enemies as they ridiculed and crucified you, but prayed for their forgiveness. In your compassion, pardon us from our secret sins and sins we do not deserve, and enlighten us to know and do your will. Amen. And the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The word of the Lord. All who see me mock me. They run like the shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Remember me, Lord, when you show favor to your people. Mighty Redeemer, remember us as we walk through the darkest valleys of life and realize that our time on earth is ending. Stay close to us when we feel the pain and loneliness of dying and take away our fears with your certain promise of paradise. Amen. Amen. sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, 
Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. The word of the Lord. This child is destined to cause the fall and rising of many in Israel. And he is so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Who is my mother, and who are my brothers? Whoever does the will of my father and mother is my brother and sister and mother. Precious Jesus, you consider us friends and care about the needs of our bodies and souls. Keep us in your care as we walk the road of life and provide the blessings we need to gain safety, contentment, and joy in your service. Yes. 
After this, when he knew that all things necessary for the scripture to be fulfilled had now been accomplished, Jesus said, I am thirsty. The jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge on it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. The word of the Lord. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. I am worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched. They put gall in my food. And gave me vinegar for my thirst. Dear Jesus, as our brother on earth, you endured the agony of pain that besieged your body when your sacrifice was complete. Knowing our experiences, hover over us with your care and compassion when our bodies and hearts are hurt. Provide us with strength that we may confess you with confidence and power. Amen. the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The word of the Lord. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Gracious Redeemer, you paid the full price for our redemption and have released us forever from the hold of Satan, the power of sin, and the fear of death. Protect us from the devil's claim that we need to do more and from the accusation of our consciences that we have not done enough. Lead us to place our entire confidence in you and to live our lives secure in your grace. Amen. came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining. 
and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last, the word of the Lord. Into your hands I commit my spirit. He has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry of He poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercessions for the transgressors. Loving Savior, at the moment of your death, you gave yourself into the loving hands of your Father. As we close our eyes in death, lead us to commit our bodies and souls to him who has summoned us by name and made us his own because of you and your love. Then we pray, let us depart in peace.
God most holy, look with mercy on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, be given over into the hands of the wicked, and suffer death upon the cross. Keep us always faithful to him, our only Savior, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 